The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of Kevin Jordan or his guests. These gardening tips and suggestions may work for you, as well as those from alternative sources. When using any garden products or tools, read and follow all label directions. The Green Acres Garden Podcast is the podcast dedicated to helping gardeners hone their growing skills while we celebrate our love of plants. So whether you're new to growing or a seasoned gardener, you're sure to learn something new. Join the fun as we have conversations with world-class growers, passionate green thumbs, and professional garden experts from Green Acres Nursery and Supply. Listen every week. We'll answer questions you didn't know you had. Well, all right, let's get things started. You know, it's springtime. I'm so happy that I wet my plants. And if you've heard that joke before, then you might be a green thumb. Welcome one and all. So glad you could make it. Thanks for tuning in and showing up to the Green Acres Garden Podcast. I'm your happy host who smells a little bit like compost, Kevin Jordan, back in studio. So glad to be here. Uh, Got Austin to my right. How's it going there, Austin? Hey, Kevin. I'm doing great. And hello to all of our listeners. Welcome back to the show. Uh, (laughs) You're cracking me up. You wet your plants? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't start that (laughs) joke, but I'll definitely use it as much as I possibly can. Probably not said that before. I love it. Oh, yeah. And honestly, I'm feeling that way in a way. Um, I actually did have to water my plants a little bit. But no, springtime, I am so happy. I I wet my pants (laughs) and my plants. Um, It's just that time of year. It's like... uh, um, I finally am feeling the warmth of the yeah. sun. When you go outside, you can kind of kind of tilt your head up and just catch a couple rays. It feels good. Uh, if I'm feeling it, the plants are feeling it, the soil is warming up. Uh, I got some tomatoes in the ground. Um, I'm looking to plant a whole lot more uh, for our summer crop. Um, my roses are blooming. It's kind of cool. We mentioned last week, uh, my boys came into the world, and the same day that they got were born, I noticed... The garden that I planted for my mother, uh, my memorial garden, it was blooming the day the kids, my boys no showed up. Way. That's so, so I got cool. some pictures. I'll post them to the to the Facebook group. There are now, st- you know, several of the nine are starting to bloom. So it's a lot wow. of fun. Uh, springtime is here. Uh, like I said, I love that warmth. Things are really kind of turning a, a corner. God, my lavender looking pretty good there, Austin. Looking yeah, what kind pretty, of lavender? It's the Spanish lavender, the, the autoquas, okay. real, real short, stocky little, little, little blossoms on there. Bees are coming back. So I'm feeling really good. We actually have uh, an interesting topic this week. This is actually, if you have even the opportunity to plant these plants, it means a good thing. It means you hopefully have a little bit of shade in your Mm. garden. And sometimes I think we garden, oh man, I have too much shade. I don't know what to plant there. Or we're afraid something we're going to plant is going to be boring. So in today's episode, we have a solution for all that that boredom. Um, it's going to bring in color and you know a lot of vitality into your garden. We have some great folklore. We're we're talking rhododendrons, azaleas, and Everett. So <laughs> it's all those things, and even Everett, you know, yeah, he's part of the the the, the chaos this week. Right. But rhododendrons and they they encapsulate azaleas. So all azaleas are rhododendrons, but not not all rhododendrons are azaleas. Because okay, yeah. So it's kind of like a you know they're how they're related. Beautiful plants. They're they're mainly evergreen. They're you know they're woody. They're flowering. They, they scale from size from ones that are really really low, like ankle height. Even a few varieties, all the ones that can get up to you know 40, 50 feet tall. Um, but most of them you're gonna find are probably somewhere in between. And but the one thing they all have in common is they're pretty gorgeous. They're really beautiful. They're durable once they get established. Uh, they do have a little a few quirks uh, that ways to kind of. Um, Improve your results when you when you cultivate them. Everett, I think, is the perfect person for us uh. to talk about the, uh, about that. Um, I find that he was an amazing interview, a really bright guy. And what I loved about him most is that not only did he have the um, just a, a wealth of knowledge about today's topic, rhododendrons and azaleas, but he has the passion to back it up. And and I and I kind of really appreciated that. Yeah, so no, Everett's a great guest. Infectious. We had him on the show uh, like a couple of years ago. It was a while back. And I, it's one of my favorite things that we get to do is we get to talk to the garden gurus, the employees at Green Acres. But I'm curious, before we get into the interview, you mentioned there's there like some folklore connected to these plans. Well, you know, Everett is the one who got me kind of fired up on it because in our discussion, yeah. he kind of brings up uh, some folklore that he heard. And I was like, man, I, I, sometimes uh, I want to go learn more. So I, I think kinda... that was from China. Yes. So there was a Korean tale that Ooh. I found of a fairy that falls in love with a human and is just so enamored by this human and kind of heartbroken in a way that, you know, their love can never be, that to be close to their their love, this fairy turns himself into an azalea. And so that way, every year, that azalea will bloom and bring joy to their, their loved one and remind them of their love. And so it's just super cool that people even, like the way we connect with plants, azaleas, I think, are one of those plants, once you see them, you go, oh yeah, I've seen that plant, I love it. They're beautiful, they're hardy. 
Um, I think there's a lot lot to go into. There's over, I think, 900 to nearly 1,000 different species and over 28,000 cultivars. So uh, needless to say, there's many of them, a lot of options. And uh, it's one of those plants that you just you love. It's, it kind of reminds you of home, I think, is another oh. folklore legend that okay. it's all about longing and uh, missing home. And I've learned that they are readily available now. There's many selections available. They're looking amazing. That's and the you, whole point. And you should be planting them right now. So if you if you got a spot and you're not sure, this is a great option, right? For sure. Before we got to our interview, I had to go walk the aisle and look at what was actually blooming and yeah, it was incredible to see what the, uh, the azaleas right now are. I'm a huge fan of azaleas, um, and they're just, they're so beautiful right now. They are just, the colors, uh, the reds, pinks, purples, whites, um, it was really, I mean, they're showstoppers. And right now, you'll see them start their bloom, and then there's other varieties that might may bloom a little bit later in spring or into summer, and then some are repeat bloomers. Uh, and so they're they're just a cool shrub. Um, I You see them a lot in landscapes, and they what's nice is, hopefully we'll get into this with Everett, but... They pair really nicely. It's like cheese and wine. Um, they pair nicely with other uh, landscape plants, your, your dogwoods, your Japanese maples, your hostas. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to kind of go into there. If you have a nice shade garden, got to consider an azalea. Okay, I love it. Let's go ahead and jump into our interview with Everett. Uh, we met up with him at the Green Acres in Folsom, and it was a treat to see him again and him to share his love for this really cool oh, yeah. plant. So let's go ahead and learn everything we can with Everett. Here we go. I've heard you're a bit of an expert, and so I've come to you in search of knowledge. Can you help me out? Absolutely. I've got pretty good background on a lot of plants, and Rhododendrons and azaleas happen to be my favorites, so. Perfect, that's why, that's why you're the perfect person for the, uh, for the show today. Glad to have you. So, ro- uh, rhododendrons, azaleas, can you kind of give, to maybe if, if I was new to gardening, I didn't know anything at all, what are they? So, rhododendrons and azaleas are actually in the same family. All azaleas are considered rhododendrons as well. They're just subspecies of the rhododendron family. They are a plant that lo- uh, loves uh, acidic soil, so they need to be, to thrive, they need to be planted in acidic soil. It's lower pH. Lower pH, so five and a half is ideal to six points on the pH scale. Uh, so moderate, I would call Pretty it acidic. moderate acidic, yep. Um, and they are plants that do west, best in uh, part shade, so morning sun, afternoon shade, or filtered light. Just like me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they do really well in the understory of, of uh, temperate forests and climates like that. Um, they just really don't tolerate the hot afternoon sun. Most varieties, there are a few varieties, a few exceptions to that, but they're a beautiful plant and you can't go wrong with them. So, so um, you, you brought up what they like. They love growing in that understory, but how did that come to be? I know you're a bit of a, you know, you love the history of them. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, rhododendrons and, and azaleas in general have reportedly been around uh, on Earth well over 50 million years. So, and that's based on fossilized examples and things like that that scientists have taken. And, um, and there are well over a thousand species of them. Wow. Uh, something like 1,033 species to be exact, probably more or less than that even. Um, they are believed to originate in um, New Guinea, Southeast Asia, and the Himalayas, uh, and then made their way to Europe or, or Great Britain in the 1600s. And then from that, they made their way to the United States. Just through trade? Just, and just through trade. Human and, movement? And, and, yep. Wow, that's incredible. So just, uh, you know, bargaining and trade with fruits and vegetables and plants and like they used to do. Uh, and then they made it to the United States in the early 1800s. So one of the things that's really cool to know, a lot of people don't understand this or have probably never heard this, but uh, ancient uh, Asian culture or uh, Chinese lore uh, believe that people that were lost in love would turn into wanjon birds, which is very much like a cuckoo bird, and they would fly around crying uh, tears of blood. And wherever those tears of blood fell on the ground, flowers would grow, uh, and those flowers were rhododendrons. So that's a really cool piece of that ancient culture. And the people just fell in love with they, them. Yeah. So the temperate climates, as you, as you might imagine, in Southeast Asia, Himalayas, all those places, uh, perfect plant, place for, 
for those to be growing and to thriving. Uh, there's one reported in India to be well over 60 feet tall. Oh, wow, so that rhododendron. That rhododendron, yeah. Yikes. Uh, yeah, that's pretty big for that kind of plant because you often see them, they're growing as, as, sh as shrubs or you know, sometimes you see a few you know, trained as a patio tree. Right, right. But uh, I also uh, noticed that there were some out there that were growing that were actually on the lower side. And they kind of caught my eye. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about any of those out there? Yeah, so the, the Azalea Satsukis is one of the smaller varieties of azaleas, uh, rhododendrons in the same family again. Um, and so they stay in the 10 to 6 to 10 inch range as far as height. Uh, they tend to get a little bit wider than they do tall, uh, but they bloom just as profuse, only smaller flowers, uh, smaller leaves, smaller structure but they bloom just as profuse as the larger varieties of azaleas. Well, you went, so. you're not lying or kidding, because uh, I just passed them, and some of them are, are packed full yeah. of flowers right now. It's a pretty, pretty good time of year to kind of get some of that color. Is this the only time that they're going to bloom? Are there some varieties that bloom at different periods or get repeat, repeat blossoms? Yeah, so in the azaleas, uh, on the azalea side, there, there are a, a spring blooming azaleas, which typically bloom this time of the year and, and through April. Um, they bloom eight to 10 weeks, depending on the weather. Some bloom a little bit less, but there are newer varieties now that they've hybridized and the, that have been produced that are rebloomers. So some of those are a little bit larger. Uh, those are called like Encore, that's the, the trade name, Encore, Bloomathon, um, Perfecta Mundos. Those all bloom two to three times a year now. Pretty fitting names. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so like Encore blooms three times a year. So spring, summer, and fall. So for those people that love the look of azaleas, um, you know, they ha can have the color all year long now rather than just in the spring. So what is the most ideal location? We are in a, we live in a pretty hot, you know, sunny area here in, in Northern California, but uh, what is the most ideal spot in our gardens that they can go? Well, the, the absolute most ideal spot would be in a filtered light setting. So having dappled sunlight all day long is, is the most fitting situation for those. Uh, so if they're getting, the sun doesn't stay on any place of the plant at any one time for very long, all day long. So with the sun moving, uh, then the light moves across the plant. So it's never enough to heat up any portion of the plant at one time. Um, so that's the ideal situation. The second best would be morning sun, so early sun, cool sun, uh, and afternoon shade. So being in the shade by two o'clock, uh, even earlier in June, July, and August in this area. Makes a big difference. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because they do love the moisture, they love the coolness. Um, uh, so having that situation is ideal. How do I plant them? What's, what is the best practice for actually putting it in the ground and then maintaining it from there on forward? Uh, well, first of all, you need to make sure that your drainage is adequate. The Zellia's rhododendrons need exceptional drainage. Uh, even though they like their soil moist, they don't like to be sitting in it. So You always uh, hear that. It's like they, they, they need their moisture, but they need it to drain. Uh, exactly. So the moisture, the soil needs to be loose and loamy and, and uh, full of organic matter. Um, the roots are really soft on both of those species of plants, the Zellies rhododendrons. Uh, so they won't penetrate through clay. They won't even do well in clay at all. Uh, and then also that makes the drainage bad. So if you don't have good drainage to begin with. But you've also mentioned that they need acidic soil. How, is there a way to, how do I know if my soil at home is acidic? Can I make it acidic? And how, if, I, if so, how do, how do I get there? But how also do I keep it acidic? Yeah, so you can test. There are plenty of uh, test kits that we sell here at Green Acres and also uh, available on, on online stores and things like that. Uh, so you can always test the soil. Um, you definitely want to, probably test it before you plant azaleas and rhododendrons because you don't want it to be too low. Probably less chance of it being too high, too high in acid than too low in acid. So testing that is essential. Um, and then uh, if your soil is not acidic enough, it's easily to make it acidic enough. So there are, you can use uh, products that you have at home, uh, leaf mold, oak leaf mulch, you know, conifer needles that have been, these all need to be well decomposed. And then things that we sell here like fir mulch, uh, soil booster, and then we have a soil that's specifically designed for acid-loving plants. Uh, and that's uh, EB stone, organic, uh, camellia, azalea, and rhododendron soil. Uh, so that's a really good one to use. You can use that 100% uh, or you can use it as an amendment. Uh, so that gets the soil there, and then to maintain it, just feeding those an acid-loving uh, fertilizer, or an acid fertilizer. Uh, that can be a fertilizer used for uh, Japanese maples, also love it, acid-loving plants, 
um, or azaleas, rhododendrons, camellias, gardenias, any of the soils that's designed, or fertilizers designed to feed those is ideal for azaleas. You beat me to it because, uh, yeah, it's like, get that soil right, but then you see the different types of fertilizers. Is, is it necessary to have that specified uh, fertilizer? Does that help? It does. It is necessary to have that because that's when you plant the azaleas and rhododendrons into that soil and you're watering them on a routine basis, those fertilizers and nutrients are going to wash away. Uh, leach out of the soil. So replenishing that frequently, uh, especially with an organic compound, you can use that monthly or, by mo or every other month um, just to maintain that, especially when during the growing season. Uh, when they're blooming and they're thriving, the, the, a lot of energy is going out of the roots and they really need that extra nutrition to stay healthy. So. That makes sense because they do seem to grow pretty well and bloom pretty heavily. Um, for some people who maybe haven't seen an azalea or rhododendron uh, up firsthand, what are some of the colors that they could hopefully expect to see? Their colors are phenomenal. They're bright reds and dark deep purples and pastel pinks and yellow and uh, even some variegated ones. There's one that my, my all-time favorite is called President Roosevelt, which is a variegated leaf rhododendron, and then it has a flower uh, which is made up of clusters of bell-shaped flowers uh, and it's reminiscent of peppermint candy because it's a mix of red and white on the flower. Um, so, and, and zellias, they range anywhere from white to neon green and the flowers uh, to pink and purple and blues and, uh, again, variegated colors. Um, red is probably our biggest selling, and there's a lot of reds. Striking. Crimson's, yeah, and they just give you that really pop of color, you know, in your, in your landscape. They, they provide so much color, but compared to a lot of other plants that maybe take a little more effort, they're, they're relatively low maintenance. Would you agree with that? They really are. I mean, just a little bit of pruning, as long as you're maintaining that acidic component in the soil and giving them adequate moisture and drainage, that's really all there is to it. Shearing them back the right time. If you want to prune azaleas, they need to be pruned right after they bloom so that they'll bloom again, you know, the next, the next season. Um, so, and then having, you know, they fit into so many different gardens, just like... Uh, um, trop tropical gardens or alpine gardens, woodland gardens, um, and, and even uh, cottage gardens. You know, they just fit into so many different. Yeah, and that's an incredible kind of feature because you mentioned that their origins were kind of more tropical in nature. But yeah, when you see them, they, they get paired oftentimes with like, like many different plants. Absolutely. And they seem to kind of, they, they master, of, <laughs> master well, of all or something. Yeah, They're really interesting. They do grow well, in, 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 in all those places that I just mentioned. And, you know, in the tropical islands, they grow in the redwood forest. They grow, you know, even up in our own forest up here in El Dorado County. So. How do we, if someone plants one in the near future right now, what is the best way to get it established before the summer as it, in terms of watering and whatnot? So getting it planted uh, as soon as possible in the temperate weather is, is beneficial. You can do it any time of the year. It just takes more um, ability to, or more, fo more focus on when to water, checking the water, making sure that it's staying adequately watered. Once you're comfortable with your own soil and your landscape, uh, then it's a lot easier to maintain that because you know how frequently it needs to be done. Um, at first, it's a little bit more essential to be checking it periodically just to make sure that you're not letting it get too dry or there's no burning on the leaves or flowers. Do we do uh, deep watering or is it, what's the best Azalea's, method for you? Azalea roots are relatively shallow, so frequent watering. Here we go. Um, and not too deep is more essential. You can encourage the roots to go deeper by watering a little longer um, as long as you're not overdoing it. But they really do have shallow root systems on them. Good to know. Good to know. Um, do you have any um, favorites out there, any, any specific varieties that have kind of caught your eye? I was walking there and I saw uh, variegated varieties mm -hmm. that were really striking. Um, for those who don't know, the variegated leaf kind of has a two-tone color, it might be right. stripes or variations of, you know, splotching or whatnot. And these ones really kind of popped. I know some people can be like variegation snobs, they're purists, they yeah. just want that, that solid leaf. But I didn't mind it one bit, didn't ruffle my feathers. They looked really pretty, especially the color of the blossoms starting to bud up just against that kind of bright white leaf. I saw one out there um, with, I think it was the Little John that had the purple uh, foliage, right. which really stood out because at a first glance, you wouldn't even realize that was an azalea. Exactly, and then the Little John is a unique one because it is one that rarely blooms. Uh, so if you get a bloom, consider yourself very lucky. But when it does bloom, it's beautiful. It's got a pink, kind of pink variegated flower on it. I've only seen it bloom maybe three times since I've been working at Green Acres. 
Um, and people are, when they get one to bloom, they just, they take pictures and they oh, yeah. and gloat about it. Victory. Yeah, exactly. So, but a favorite of mine would probably be one that we call Phoenicia, Phoenicia Formosa. We were just talking about that. Yeah, and that's a great one because and it's probably our biggest seller across really? the board. Really? Yeah. Oh, it makes sense. Uh, it's one that gets quite large. It has a long-lasting flower, which is a variegated pink purple color, um, and it tolerates a lot more sun than a lot of other sun, uh, uh, zellies do. It is a southern indica variety, so that itself, you know, any plant, any azalea that has a southern indica in the botanical name is one that's gonna tolerate a lot more sun than just a, a general spring azalea or even an encore or one of those other varieties. Southern Indica, that's South India? Is that what it yes, means it's exactly. connected so, to? Yeah, right. that's some warm weather. <laughs> that's, yeah, so they'll tolerate a lot more. They still do better in a little bit of shade, especially in the afternoon in our hot, hot situation here but they will tolerate a lot more sun and that's, heat. Than that's good to know, because I think a lot of people, they they come in, they love that plant, but they maybe don't quite have the canopy form just yet in the right. landscape. That's right. So that does, that's a really good choice. You said, what, six six feet or more? Six feet. That's pretty good size. On that. Yeah, there's, and we sell a lot of Southern Indica varieties, especially as we get into warmer weather. Uh, we have probably four or five varieties in the yard right now. Um, and, um, uh, something else to, to keep in mind with that too, as as the weather gets hot and then the blooms start to fade a little bit, uh, a, a lot of azaleas, if they're getting too much sun, they're they're going to burn for sure. Oh yeah. Um, but if they're not getting enough sun, then they're not going to flower, or they're going to be very spindly. So that's something to consider when you're planting those as well. Uh, they'll still they'll still grow, but they're just going to look spindly and not healthy. That's a really good point. So if you had super dense shade, yeah. they would grow and be fine, but you're just, you're just not gonna get as much color. Right, or it just any takes color. a lot of energy. Yeah, exactly. And the light has to help that be created. Good to know. If you were creating um, a garden right now and it's got all those requirements, maybe some morning sun, some dappled light, a little bit of shade, a good area for, for your azaleas, what other plants are gonna come to your mind as uh, maybe ones that are larger, same size or smaller even, what, what plants do you think kind of pair well? Uh, there's quite a few actually. So ferns would be my, is one of my first choices uh, to go with azaleas. And then um, mondo grasses. Uh, oh yeah, I was, I was admiring those. Yeah, uh, liriopes, which is the uh, creeping turf lily. Uh, those are great as well. Oh yeah, the uh, silver dragon and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Gardenias, uh, that also gives you that fragrance, which, you know, in a tropical garden, it's, you know, Love you can't gardenias. have a tropical garden without fragrance, but also in a woodland garden. Uh, camellias um, go really well with them. Uh, there's a lot of other grasses that do well. Um, fatsias or Japanese aurelias. Oh yeah. Um, the cast iron plant, aspidistras, uh, those all do well. Uh, even mugo pines. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, for the Zen, the Zen feel or something like that is, is a great plant. It's a dwarf bamboos, uh, another great choice. And then a lot of low ground covers, mosses and things like that. Oh, you're, get, you're getting me excited. I love a good shade garden. I grew up, in our backyard, we had, we had a pool, thankfully, that was fun to swim, but we had the tiny little strip of hard pan around the, our pool. Yeah. And it was not much to you know, work with and just blazing hot sun. And so I always like dreamt about like, oh, having trees and a canopy one day. And, and I've moved, I'm an adult now, and front yard is ripping hot. Backyard, I've got some shade. There you go. And so I, th I think it's, I kind of fantasize about creating just a lush, beautiful shade garden with all those things you listed. I mean, it's, ugh, it's out of my dreams, Everett. Yeah, that's, that's something that I always had to dream of when I had my own house to do the same thing. And that's, I have created that. Uh, so that's my own little paradise now at home when I go home and the back porch and I have all those plants that I just listed and more. Yeah. Um, even some alpine plants that I've brought down from the creeks and rivers, you know, that, that thrive in that same environment, you know, as the azaleas do, so. You know, before I let, also I, one last question. Um, I know you, you've been working with plants for quite some time. You're a bit of an expert. I'm sure you're helping people and you're <laughs> between your friends and family. You know, yep. I'm sure they come to you quite a bit. Um, what do you love most? about being a plant person, about, about working with plants. Oh my outside. gosh, the beauty for one thing of all the plants, there are so many plants that are just that we have here, but just places I've traveled and seen, that's just one of the things that just make me relax. Plants in general just make me relax. So if it has flowers on it, even more the better, you know? And I've seen so many unique plants and flowers in my lifetime 
Um, I've been, been a plant guru or nerd since I was very little. And uh, there's just nothing better than walking through the woods and you know, enjoying the plants as they grow naturally. And then also seeing them in the landscape, what you create yourself or what somebody else creates. Uh, it's just such a peaceful feeling. And knowing that the, the creation that we have, you know, what's there for us to look at and, and uh, enjoy. Yeah, life is pretty marvelous. Um, I lo- great words. Thank you so much, Everett. I appreciate it. I love what you do here. And I just, I'm so thankful that you made some time for us today. Thank oh, absolutely. you. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right, we are back from our interview with Everett. Thank you, Everett. It was such a pleasure to see you again and to uh, learn all of this garden knowledge that is, he is just happy to share. I could tell he was having a good time. It was a blast. You know, it's always fun kind of connecting with somebody else who loves plants, but he also had, like, like I said, the, the knowledge to back it up and a lot of uh, experience as well. He knows a lot about uh, things outside of rhododendrons and azaleas, too, so I'd be curious to pick his brain on some other topics. Sure. And so it was really fun to kind of learn from another green thumb, uh, especially with somebody with so much experience. He's been, he'd been doing it there for yeah. a while. He's the buyer, so um, he's kind of like in the know on all these different varieties and what they're capable of and when they're available. And, and so that's definitely, if you're going to go to the store, I remember I know where we were talking in the interview, how we might plug him and say, hey, if people are in that area and you really want some, some hands-on garden help, Go to the Folsom uh, location oh, and, and ask for Everett. Ask for Everett. And he's down. He, he's he, like, he is. He wants to help you. Absolutely. He gets a kick out of it, um, oddly enough. Uh, it's it's a rare breed, <laughs> uh, which we I appreciate that he exists. So what what is your experience with growing rhododendrons and azaleas? They're beautiful for me. You, you Often you'll see them, like I said, in a landscape that already has an established canopy. Um, so a little bit of dappled light and some shade is, you know, is always helpful. Um, there are some varieties um, that, that can handle a bit more sun, and th- those ones are nice to kind of look forward to. The Phoenicia, the Formosa, uh, that one's really cool. But uh, for the most part, if you can get some shade to them, get them in some soil that is well-drained, uh, rich with organic matter, acidic. They, mm-hmm. they are like, um, they're, they're like a concert goer. Um, they like their acid, okay? <laughs> they're <laughs> they're so, going to a, yeah, like a, a fish show. Yeah, absolutely. And so they give me some acid. Uh, <laughs> and so they they love that. And so uh, the azalea camellia mix, there's ways that we talked about, about you know increasing that acid, mm-hmm. acidity in your soil. They appreciate it, um, but also just really having rich soil that can absorb some of that moisture, but at the same time retain um, some drainage because their roots like moisture. They're kind of fine and shallow, um, but, uh, but they do need air as well. So if you can kind of create that balance, you're going to be successful. Right now is a perfect time to kind of get them planted before the, uh, the hot times come. <laughs> they're coming. Uh, the, 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 the dark times, the hot times. <laughs> um, but they're coming. And that's, but right now is a perfect time. And what's also kind of nice about it is that a lot of them are in bloom and they're looking pretty sharp. So if you want to get a good handle on what they're going to look like, mm-hmm. you know, when the, when the times are good, now is a gr- great opportunity for that. These plants rock. I think what's kind of nice too is once they get established, they tend to be a little bit you know, more predictable and hardy. And, and you they know, stick around. They stick around. That's yeah. awesome. Dependable plants. I like that. Yeah. And so, and if I have to fall in love with some listeners and grow into an azalea and just remind them <laughs> of how beautiful these plants are, I will do it. Okay. Watch out. But uh, they're great plants. Appreciate it, Everett. Yep. Thank um, you, Everett. Go out and bug them out there in Folsom, folks. Yeah, go find them. And that's all the time we have for this week. Kevin, go ahead and take us out. Well, another week just shot right by. I can't wait to get back in the garden, uh, get my hands dirty. It's going to be a busy week, busy, busy week, changing diapers, planting seeds, pulling weeds, <laughs> hey. uh, and getting back to you. So I, uh, please come back next week, garden friends, for more garden adventures. Thank you so much for everybody for being here. We love it. We appreciate it. And until that, garden friends, happy gardening to you all. And please never, never stop, stop growing. growing. Woo.